this is the study, and I'm not going to jump into this right away, and if you read the title, you probably see why I'm not. The title is Protandum Attenuates Intimal Hyperplasia in Human Saphenous Veins Cultured Ex Vivo Via a Catalase Dependent Pathway. So that's the progression of atherosclerosis. And we've talked before about how oxidative stress is involved in the early part of that process. But it's, ox it's also involved in the later part of the process, and that's where this Ohio State study comes in. So let's assume, again going from left to right here, that oxidative stress leads to atherosclerosis. It's a slow process, 30 or 40 years developing. Uh, an alarming part of this is that atherosclerosis begins with something called fatty streaks in the wall of an artery. They're now being seen in children as young as 10 or 12 years old. So they can begin in the first decade of life. It's a process that builds and builds, and by the time a person reaches 40, 50, 60 years of age, there's almost certainly evidence of atherosclerosis, probably in everybody in this room. It's a time bomb. And help, <clears throat> uh, lifestyle can help prevent it. Good diet, exercise, all the things you hear about can help slow it down. And it doesn't have to be the thing that does you in in the end, but it's a process. It's like if you build a new house, 20 years later, the pipes will be rusty and there will be some corrosion and deposits. It might be still fully functional, but that, that happens. All right, so if atherosclerosis leads to partial or complete blockage of arteries, you go to a doctor either for a checkup or because you're having chest pains or for one reason or another, and if it's bad enough, there are three common surgical interventions that can occur. One is a coronary artery bypass, and again, I think you all have heard about people who have that. It's extraordinarily common surgery these days. Another procedure done by cardiologists without so much invasive surgery is angioplasty, and that's threading a balloon into that blocked artery, inflating the balloon. You can open it up. These days, initially, it was just the balloon, and it was found out, sure, you can stretch that artery open if it's clogged by plaque, but within a month or two, it starts to close down again, not surprisingly. Now, what's done is a stent is inserted, so I'll tell you about that and show you some pictures of a metal stent that, once the artery is opened up, can help keep it open. It also has uh, consequences and has medical problems produced by the surgery itself. And finally, carotid endarterectomy refers to the carotid arteries, big arteries in your neck that take the blood supply to your, bl to your brain. Very important arteries, obviously. They too get clogged with plaque. And so you may, have, you may know family members or relatives or friends who've had carotid endarterectomy. What the surgeon does there is he literally temporarily bypasses the clogged part, opens it up, and just scrapes out the gunk, and I'll show you a disturbing picture of that <laughs> later on as well. All right, all three of these procedures have failure rates. They're not complete permanent solutions to the problem. And if you look at the 10-year failure rate, 10 years is a long time for a, a surgical procedure to improve your quality of life. But with coronary artery bypass surgery, after 10 years, up to 50% of the grafts have failed. They're either almost completely blocked again, or they have been completely blocked. And so often, coronary artery bypass surgery has to be repeated, or some other, one of these other procedures sometimes can help. With stents and angioplasty, they don't even last that long. Sometimes four or five years is about what you expect from a stent. And I'll show you the reason they fail. And the same with carotid endarterectomy, a, a little better result there, maybe 30% failure rate after, after 10 years. But what we want to look at is what causes that failure rate. And it's our old nemesis, oxidative stress, again. 
oxidative stress leads to something that was in the title of that Ohio State paper, intimal hyperplasia. So I'll show you what that means. And that's really the culprit that causes those opened vessels or bypassed vessels to clog up again after some years. Intimal hyperplasia is the problem. And what causes the intimal hyperplasia, at least in the context of the Ohio State study, was shown to be oxidative stress, something protandum can help with. All right, what, it, what it does, do those words mean, intimal hyperplasia? It's simply a thickening of the wall of the blood vessel. So you might wonder, why didn't I say that in the first place? If you look at, if you look at the cross section of a blood vessel, what you see is there are several layers. If you cut a, a copper pipe open, there's just one layer. It's copper, all right? That's the wall of that pipe. If you cut an artery open, you'll see there are three distinct layers. So the, the pink circle in the middle is the lumen. That's where the blood flows through the hole in the pipe. And the innermost layer is called intima, which means innermost, all right? Physicians have a way of making things uh, more complicated than they should be maybe. The media is the next layer, that pink layer, and that means middle, or the one in the middle. And the outer layer is called adventitia. So there are three distinct layers. What happens when the intima uh, proliferates? If that middle layer, st those cells start to divide, what happens is the wall, that inner part of the, the lining gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And here you see it protruding into the lumen. If this happened all around, the lumen would get smaller and smaller and smaller. The media also gets thicker, and cells in the medium, largely smooth muscle cells, and some of those will migrate into the intima. So you get this thickening of the wall that can occlude a vessel. Intimal hyperplasia, this wall thickening, is an iatrogenic condition. What that means, you, you may go to your doctor for some procedure, you go back a month later for a follow-up, and he may say something like, well, you have an iatrogenic infection, and it's, you're probably thinking, oh no, an iatrogenic infection. <laughs> what that means is he caused it, okay? He, he, <laughs> and, and not, not intentionally, it may have just been accidental, but iatrogenic means physician-induced. And Dan Royal can probably tell you there are lots of those things that are physician-induced because a lot of the procedures have consequences. And intimal hyperplasia is one of those consequences. So it's not done on purpose, and it doesn't require a, a, a malpractice attorney or anything like that. But it is caused by the procedure. All right, here, here are actual arteries. The upper picture is a cross-section through a saphenous vein, this one is from a pig, and you see those, it looks very much like the, the little diagram I showed you. So there's a big opening in the middle, that's the lumen. There's a dark intimal layer, a lighter colored media layer, and an adventitia around it. So that's a healthy vein on top. No intimal hyperplasia, a thin lining. And that vein normally lives in an environment where the oxygen concentration, that's what PO2 means, is about 25 torr. That's how we measure oxygen. So the oxygen level here is 25. That vein deals with taking used blood back to the heart. That's why it's got low oxygen content. But the vein is built to live in that environment. The vein at the bottom is same vein, saphenous vein from the same animal. And this section of the vein was cultured at high oxygen, 125, so it's five times higher. And that's close, that's a little higher than arteries see, but it's close. Arteries normally see 100 tor concentration of oxygen. So that's the difference between veins and arteries. Veins carry low oxygen blood, arteries carry high oxygen blood. And oxygen, believe it or not, is toxic. You may think oxygen is good for you, and it is good for you, you die if you don't have oxygen. But you might be surprised if we took a, a healthy young adult rat who's breathing here at sea level 
an atmosphere that's 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen. If we put that rat in a plastic box and we gave him 100% oxygen, which is only five times more than normal, in 72 hours that healthy animal would be dead because oxygen is that toxic. Five times more would destroy his lungs and the animal would die. So when a heart surgeon, and I'm going to show you pictures of how this happens, takes a piece of a vein from your leg and uses it as new plumbing to go around an artery in your heart, he's asking a vein to do an artery's job, and it's going to see much higher oxygen than it's used to seeing. And it does a good job, but it pays a price and it suffers. Why is artery bypass surgery done? If this represents, here in a very simple picture, an artery in your heart, and you develop plaque over the course of 10 or 20 or 40 years, again, you see the lumen of the artery is closing up. And the artery, by the way, is at 100 torres, high oxygen. So the, the surgeon will take a piece of vein from your leg, and just like a plumber might put in a new pipe around a clogged, if, a, if, if a, you have a drain pipe and a tree has grown through it with roots, you'll put in a new piece of pipe to bypass the problem, the obstruction. And that's what this vein is used for. So on the surface of your heart, you have a bypass around it. Now, the problem is that vein, which should be seeing oxygen at a level of 25, is now seeing oxygen at a level of 100. It causes oxidative stress uniquely to this vein, and the result is the walls of the vein thicken and will eventually obstruct the lumen to the point where it may close up and clog. So where does the Ohio State study come in? And I'm going to quickly take you through the results. It measured the wall thickness in human saphenous veins that were going to be used for surgery. The surgeon removes more than he needs because you, you don't want to run short of pipe if you're a plumber. So there's leftover, there's leftover pipe every time a person undergoes bypass surgery. That's what was used in this study. They were incubated either at low oxygen, and that's described here as the freshly isolated. They don't change if they're incubated in low oxygen, or at high oxygen. And after two weeks incubated, where the only variable really is high oxygen, you get intimal hyperplasia. You get wall thickening. So this was done outside living people in a laboratory model. And so the blue bar is where the intimal thickness should be if you're looking at the A panel. The red bar is after two weeks at high oxygen and the wall has already thickened several fold. And the green bar is the same kind of a culture except protandum has been added to the culture medium. And so even in high oxygen, the protandum treated veins have avoided intimal hyperplasia. They, the walls have not thickened. They're staying at the same thickness as in freshly isolated healthy vein. Here we're measuring the intima, panel A, the media, the next layer, and panel B. And what you can see is with protandum in the diagram on the right, the, the intima and the media layers are still thin. There's a big opening in this pipe. It's conducting lots of blood. The bottom picture is what happens if the thickening occurs, the red bars, and you can see that the, the, the area, a cross-sectional area, is reduced maybe by 80% in that diagram. So very little blood is now able to get through. So protandum has blocked this process that's really the bane of cardiac surgeons because they can do their surgery just fine, but it's the consequences, even years, begin sometimes weeks or months, but if you look at the number of cells that are actively dividing, again, freshly isolated, healthy vein, very few dividing cells, incubated in oxygen, high, where it's going to see it if it becomes an artery or a replacement for an artery, a lot of dividing cells. That's required for that wall to thicken. It takes more cells. They're multiplying and uh, getting thicker and thicker. Protandum, the right bar, completely blocks 
that intimal thickening. If we measure free radical production in these veins, uh, A, B, and C are again fresh vein, B is cultured at high oxygen, and C is high oxygen with protandum. And what we're looking for is the red fluorescent stain. So you can see in the red one, in the A, A panel, very little evidence of free radical production. B, a lot of it, and C, incubated with protandum for the two-week period back to the A levels. So it's blocking free radical production by scavenging those radicals. They're quantified in the bars on the right, so in the, the, the color code is the same. Blue is healthy, red, high oxygen, green, high oxygen with protandum. So again, we see the protection. This is looking at lipid peroxidation marker. This one is very closely related to T-bars, which was in our original study. It's a specific component of T-bars for HNE. And again, look at the level of 4-HNE in the blue bar. That's healthy. High oxygen, but with protandum, it's even lower this time than the blue bar. It's better, off, it's better than new. It's better than uh, the freshly isolated vein. But without protandum at high oxygen, you can see a lot of this lipid peroxidation product, maybe five times more. And why, why is this? the vein protected with protandum. Again, it's the same old story you've heard about in other studies. Three important antioxidant enzymes have been sharply upregulated. Again, the blue bar is normal healthy vein, incubated at high oxygen. Uh, the cells haven't induced the enzyme to protect them, but if we add protandum, the green bar, all three of these enzymes are dramatically induced to provide the protection that you saw in the previous slide. So the conclusions are that the saphenous veins used in arterial bypass surgery suffer from oxidative stress, and that's no big surprise, due to the higher concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood that they're now asked to carry. As a consequence of the oxidative stress, intimal hyperplasia, or thickening of the wall, occurs, and that can eventually lead to reblockage or restenosis. You may have heard that, uh, that term used. Restenosis simply means that what was blocked and opened up is now reblocked. And the important part for us, protandum prevented this wall thickening in saphenous veins cultured at high oxygen, suggesting that NERF2 activation may extend the life of arterialized veins in vivo. And I want to show, um, kind of out of time, but I want to mention angioplasty very quickly. This is a blocked artery, <clears throat> and you see it longitudinally and in cross-section with a big yellow plaque that's occluding part of the uh, lumen. Here, um, a catheter has been threaded into the, up through the aorta and into the to coronary arteries, and this is a very thin-looking wire but it has an inflatable balloon on the end, and outside the balloon is a little collapsed wire cylinder. This is like if you took a piece of chicken wire and made a cylinder, you could compress it down into a very thin rod. And if you inflate the balloon that's inside, you can expand that cylinder. So that's what the surgeon does. He locates this where the plaque is, inflates the balloon, and you can see that wire mesh cylinder now being ex inflated expanded, and that holds the vessel open without that wire stent. That's what a stent is. Without the stent, the vessel would collapse when you deflated the balloon, or at least largely. And so here, after you expand the wire, the wire mesh, you deflate the balloon, pull it out, and now you've got an artery in the picture on the right in cross-section that has a, a wire cage holding that plaque against the wall, making sure there's a big lumen. The unfortunate part is this is six months later. These are from pigs. And on the left, you see a lumen that is wide open, and those little black dots are actually the wires in cross-section of the stent that's been expanded. So you can see it holding that vessel open. If you come back and look at another pig with another stent, but after six months, 
look at the difference. You can see that light pink tissue labeled intimal hyperplasia. That's a proliferation of cells that in only six months has closed that lumen down probably 80%. And that's the iatrogenic problem. It was created by placing the stent. The stent did a great job initially, but this is a problem with, and this is a bare metal stent. One of the ways um, medical device companies have responded to this is many stents are now coated. They're called uh, drug eluding stents or coated stents. And they are, have time release chemicals that inhibit intimal hyperplasia on the metal frame itself. That lasts for a while and it improves things maybe for a year or two, but not for the really long haul. So, so intimal hyperplasia is a real problem. Finally, this is carotid end arterectomy. The other procedure, this is the big arteries in the neck. And this is an actual picture of what uh, a frequent location for the plaque develop is a fork in the road. So this carotid artery, artery has a branch in the side of your neck. And that's where plaque often develops. This is what it looks like if the surgeon opens, <clears throat> opens that artery. It looks like a big chunk of a cheeseburger caught in there. Um, and what, what they do <laughs> is they literally, <laughs> literally scrape, if you had a cheeseburger for lunch, I'm sorry, but <laughs> they literally scrape that out and sew the artery back together. And it, it works with, with highly su uh, high success rate. I said after 10 years, about 70% are still fine. But that's a traumatic event for the artery. It's been opened up, the lining scraped out. And so these, when they fail, it's usually due to intimal hyperplasia as well. And so finally, <clears throat> whoops, I th thought there was one more slide, but maybe not. Uh, the implication is that one and a half million people a year undergo this procedure. And that's a huge, a huge number of people who have processes going on that are almost surely going to lead to failures of uh, these carotid arteries, bypass surgeries, the angioplasty, the coronary artery, end arterectomy, a big market for something that can help prevent intimal hyperplasia. And I think you're connected with a product that might be really useful to do exactly that. So sorry for overtime. Thank you very much. All my hands are making weird signs. Oh, things I've never seen.